In our series on pursuit, we're talking about pursuing success, looking at the life of David, a little window in his life. And just to jump right in, last week we were talking about a time when David just wipe out failed, big, massive collapse failure. And we talked about how to avoid those. The reality is, though, we can't avoid all the failures. So what do we do when we fail? And I, I want to today give you a, an additional motivation to avoid failure as long as, well, as a little bit of advice on how to do it by looking at a, a story out of David's life. But before I say that, I want to talk, give you a little piece of, an important thought for you. There's a a misconception people have right now, they tend to use a word, and I hate when people use words wrong. I'm a speaker and a writer, so I think words are important, and I hate when somebody misuses one. And a word that gets misused all the time right now is the word karma. Everybody say, oh, that must be your karma, all that crap like that. Okay. Let me, I, I explain this once in a while just because you, you need to understand it. Karma is a Hindu word. And what it means is, what you do in this life impacts the next one. In Hindu thought, not saying true in Hindu thought, is if, if you live like a total jerk here, you come back as a cockroach. Okay? That's karma. Okay? Karma is what you do in this life. If you're really, really good, you'll come back as a, a really good cockroach. You know, but th- th- that's karma. Now, there's a different thing that most people in America, when they use the word karma, they don't mean karma, they mean something else. And the old way of explaining it from a Bible perspective was to call it the law of reaping and sowing. You reap what you sow. And the problem is, is who always raised on a farm? Yeah, everybody, there's like four of us, okay? And in, in Bible days, everybody was raised on a farm. That was just, that's how you were raised. You grew up on a farm. And th- what happened was, there's different ways you plant different plants. I mean, when I think of the word plant, I think dig a hole, put a seed in there, add some water, right? Well, that works if you're planting certain things. But if you're planting wheat or barley, or an ar- for, to give you something you can write to, grass in your front yard, you don't go out there with a load of grass seed and make a hole for each seed of each seed and go throughout your yard doing that, right? That nobody ever does that. How do you plant grass seed? It's the same way you'd plant barley or wheat in their day, is you have a big old sack of seed, you reach your hand in and you go like this. That's called sowing. We could call it scattering seed, right? You take the seed and you scatter it. And then what will come up is what we the, the word old word was you you reap and you you reap it. Now, we don't use the word reap very often, do we? In regular conversation, you don't use that. If I say reaper, you think grim reaper, dude with the big scythe and the, the hood. No, all that is is gathering what you've scattered. And the biblical principle is this. What you scatter in your life, you will gather in your life. If you are sowing bad, you will gather bad. If you're scattering bad, you'll gather bad back. Now, here's where it gets complicated. Because our lives are incredibly intertwined with other people's lives. We don't operate, each of us gets five acres. We all, we're shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow, life to life. And frequently, you've had this happen in your life, somebody else has scattered seed and you've gathered what they scattered. Right? Sometimes things have hit you in your life that you didn't do anything to deserve and man, it knocked you out cold and left you down for a while, right? Because what one person scatters the people around them also gather. Well, it applies to you too. What you scatter, the people around you will gather. And if you spend your life scattering things that are destructive and scattering seeds that bring people down, the people it will bring down the most are the people that are closest to you. And we're going to start out and we're going to look at a, t- at a point in David's life where David has been scattering seeds and he's scattered some good seeds, but he's also scattered some bad seeds. And the bad seeds that he scattered choke out the potential for the good seeds. And then we're going to look into how to make it so that the seed that we scatter 
in our lives is productive and helpful and good for the people around us. So we don't have to be ashamed of the impact we have in people's lives, but we can actually have an impact in people's lives that helps them get successful while we're becoming successful in a biblical sense of successful. Does that make sense? So you want to turn in your Bible or turn on your Bible to 1 Samuel 29. It's a little tiny chapter. It's kind of wedged in between big stuff. So a lot of times people just skip over this whole chapter. They just go straight to chapter 30. But I think chapter 29 has got one really, really cool thing that happens in the middle of it. And to catch you up, in case you're behind here, we're covering David's life for a little wedge of it. During the time God's training him to be successful for God. And David's basically been on the run from King Saul who's ticked at him and wants to kill him. During this process, we've seen two or three amazing characteristics about David. For one, we haven't really talked about this one, but you see it very clearly. David had an amazing gift, and I'm not sure how to describe it, but it was the gift of attraction and leadership. People were drawn to David like iron filings go to a magnet. People just wanted to be around him, and they wanted to follow him, and he could, people just came to him. Matter of fact, is anybody here currently on the lamb from the law? The sheriff's department pays me to say that once a month or so, and because once in a while, you'll get somebody who's not real bright. No. Nah. Now, here's the thing. When somebody's on the run from the law, they're usually alone, right? They might have their spouse or their girlfriend or boyfriend with them, but generally speaking, when you're on the lamb, you do that as a solo act. David had such charisma, such magnetism, that when David went on the run from the king who is trying to kill him, 600 men gathered around him, just not an organized thing. One or two show up one day, a couple days later, two or three more show up, and another guy. 600 of them. And when David goes into exile, leaves his home country, moves to Philistia, the land of the Philistines, and into this little rundown little village called Ziklag, all 600 men not only come with him, they bring their families because they want to be where David is. And that's some gift. And then as we've seen, there's a couple other things that are pretty awesome about David. And they are, number one, David had an incredible trust of God. And number two, he had an incredible transparency in his relationship with God. So if you read the Psalms, David wrote half-ish of those, maybe more, maybe less. In that area, he wrote a whole bunch of the book of Psalms. And what you see in there is, number one, a person who trusts God in every situation. But number two, somebody who's very honest about his trust. When life stinks, David said, life stinks. When he's struggling with a sin, he says, I'm struggling with a sin. When things are going great, he says, woohoo, yay, God. It's very transparent and very open. And what do you think can happen if you take a person who has that magnetism, that leadership, that ability for people to want to be around him, and you place in that person a transparent, trusting relationship with God, what's going to happen to the people who are around him? They're going to be drawn to God. Okay? Now, we're going to see something really odd today. It's going to be in one word. We're not going to read all the chapter. I'm just going to, let me tell you what's happened with the chapter. David has spent for the year, last year and a half, roughly, he has been living in a little town called Ziklag outside of Israel, and he's been making a living by raiding other villages nearby and then going back to the king, Achish is the king of that area, and telling him he raided a different place and, no doubt, giving Achish a cut. Okay? And he's been doing this for a year and a half. Well, the Philistines and the Israelites got along like Palestinians and Jews. And every year it was a tradition that they would get together and have a war. You know, the way that some teams have, have football, they'd have a war. And so the Philistines are gathering to go to war against Israel, David's home country. And Achish has gotten so used to having David around, he says, David, come on, you can fight with us this year. It's like he got traded in mid-season. And he's supposed to wear the other uniform and show up and play in the other, for the other team. And he shows up with his 600 guys, and they, they come into the, all the other Philistines. There's all these kings of city-states, or they're all coming together with their armies, and they got all the armies together. And the other Philistine kings look around, and they see David. 
and they start muttering. Do you remember the, the David song? Yeah, that song the people wrote in Israel, it's like a top 40, it was number one for like weeks. And the chorus is, Saul has killed his thousands, and David his tens of thousands, and you know who the tens of thousands were, right? Us! David made his name killing us. Do you really want to give him a sharp object and have him stand behind you during a battle? And they universally, except for King Achish, says, no, thank you. We don't trust this guy any farther than we can throw him and his 600 men. Send him home. And this is where it gets interesting. Achish, the king he's been serving and lying to for the past year and a half, comes to David, and in verse 6, it says, So Achish finally summoned David and said to him, I swear by the Lord that you have been a trustworthy ally. I think you should go with me into battle, for I've never found a single flaw in you from the day you arrived until today. But the other Philistine rulers won't hear of it. Please don't upset them, but go back quietly. Now, I have no idea what's going through David's head. Whether he's stuck and he doesn't want to go fight the the Israelites, whether he's planning to turn during battle, we don't know. It doesn't ever tell us what David is thinking, but David protests. Verse 8, what have I done to deserve this treatment, David demanded. What have you ever found in your servant? that I can't go and fight the enemies of my lord the king. But Akish insisted, as far as I'm concerned, you're as perfect as an angel of God. Now, sometimes one word, if you pay attention, can change everything. And that one word is found in verse 6, where Akish says, and if you have a Bible, look down at this. He said to him, I swear by the Lord. Anybody looking at that word? Do you see anything weird about that word? Did you know, look at the R. The R is capitalized. So there's the D, which means the O is too. O, just small O and big O looks exactly the same. It's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Well, that's weird. Why would you capitalize every letter in a word? Now, you do it for an acronym like NASA, but why, they're obviously not, this is not NASA. Why is it capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D? Well, that's because when we're translating the Bible, like we, when they translate the Bible, people actually know Hebrew really well, one of the things you don't want to do is offend people you don't need to offend. And one group that can be offended easily are Jewish people and Jewish believers. Because Jewish people believe you should never say God's covenant name out loud. You shouldn't even write it down. That name that you're kind of used to hearing is Jehovah or Yahweh. And the word that is there in the Hebrew is not Lord as in master, it's Lord as in Jehovah or Yahweh, the covenant God of the Israelites. Key word, of the Israelites. Not of the Philistines. The Philistines had their own set of gods. And they all had names and none of them were named Yahweh or Jehovah. The king, King Achish of the Philistines, of the city of Gath, has been watching David. And I don't think I'm stretching here. He is being drawn to God through the life of David. He is seeing David, and instead of swearing by his own gods, he swears by Israel's God because he sees something in David and David's God that his God can't provide. His God, which is merely a statue that you burn stuff to. A God who's vindictive and spiteful, and you don't know what he's going to do. He is drawn to David's God, and he makes this huge statement, by Yahweh, I know you're a good man. You're even an angel of God. God. Not an angel of Marduk or whatever God he was serving, angel of David's God. Akish is moving toward God. There's only one problem. For the past year and a half, what kind of seed has David been scattering? Seeds of deceit, and murder, and lying, and everything that he'd not stood for before. And David was in absolutely no position to follow up 
on the movement a quiche made toward God. A quiche is gathering the bad seeds that David has been sowing. And we never hear any more about a quiche. Now remember, David's grandmother, her name was Ruth. Ruth was not Jewish. Ruth was from Moab, another nation around Israel. And she saw in her mother-in-law, as it turned out, who God really was, came to a relationship with God, and went on to be the, the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. So God lets people in, even if they're not Israelites, even back then. There was nothing to keep Achish, the king of a Philistine city, from becoming a follower of the true God, except the life David was living. And now we look around at the seed we've been sowing, the seed we've been scattering. And we re recognize a truth that our failures, just like David's failures, cost us and cost others. When you sow the bad seeds, when you sow discord and jealousy, when you sow hatred, when you sh show, sow selfishness, it doesn't just impact you. It doesn't just gather back to you. It gathers to everyone around you. I'm sure there are plenty of people in this room who could give me a story about how the seeds their parents scattered are still impacting them in negative ways today. So the seed we scatter costs us it costs others in david's case it costs and in our case it'll cost us a lot of times the ability to let other people know about god to reach other people for jesus it'll it'll mess up that ability it'll mess up our ability to advance god's kingdom to take god's principles and bring them out on earth it'll mess that up but let me let me give you a piece of good news before you get too discouraged and that is that God works through and can overcome your failures. Whew. You'll notice David is screwing up massively and Achish is still drawn to God. He's doing a really poor job of showing Christ to Achish, but it's still good enough that Achish is being drawn by God. So don't freak out. Don't, don't spend your time going crazy, bad, feeling bad for yourself. But what I want to talk about for the rest of our time is not, oh, we should feel bad because we've scattered bad seed. It's to recognize the power of the seed that you scatter and how to make it so that the seed you're scattering has positive impact and is the kind of seed you want to gather in your own life and you want those around you to gather as well. Does that make sense? That's what we're going to talk about. And to do that, I want to, I want to go to another passage. I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, I've been reading that recently and it's really speaking to me and I want to talk today about how to control we're going to finish up today talking about how to control what we what we gather what we scatter and what other others gather let me read, read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 5 starting verse 10 for we must we must all stand before Christ to be judged we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord we work hard to persuade others God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Moving down to verse 14. Christ's love controls us. Other translations say compels us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view how differently we, we know, know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and new life has begun. And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. And as I, as I work through that passage, okay, four things today I want to show you on how you can make sure the seed that you're scattering is seed worth gathering both in your life and those around you. And the first thing that, that jumps out at me 
is to think eternally. Verse 10 said, we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We'll each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. So we have to think eternally about ourselves. Think about the ju- what's coming. But, but even more, verse 16 said, we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. See, this, is going, now this one will wreck your world. If you can get this into your head and start applying this in your life, it will just radically change everything. When you start viewing everybody as an eternal being made in the image of God. Because what we do is, okay, anybody else here selfish? Anybody? Yeah. My natural tendency, not my supernatural tendency, my natural tendency is to view others as to what they can provide to me. How can they help me accomplish what I want to accomplish? What can they provide to make me happy? What can they provide to make me feel good about myself? But if you switch that around and say, okay, this is the person that Jesus Christ died for, that God wants to have a relationship with eternally, if I view each person that way and recognize that my role in their life is to either help them connect with God and grow closer to God or to help them advance God's kingdom and become all he wants them to be that way, if I recognize in every individual that I see that God wants to be connected with them, and God wants them to be part of his kingdom, his power, his change in the world for the good, it changes everything in how you deal with everybody. When you go to work and somebody's being a jerk, you look at them and go, okay, there's some work to be done here. And I may not be crazy about that person, but God is. God, is, God loves them the way he loves me. God wants them to have a relationship with him that just as much as he wants me to. And my job is to go in there and be a David. Living that life that attracts. You know, you have a choice in that matter, don't you? When you meet anybody, you have the choice. I am going to live to attract them to myself or I'm going to live to repel them from myself because I find them annoying. I do not want them around me. So therefore, I will live in a way that repels them. You ever done that? Oh, ouch, huh? And then you recognize that from an eternal perspective, you might be the only person God has in their life to attract them to God. You may be the only person God has placed in their life to speak love and hope and truth into their lives. And matter of fact, this, you're going like, to not like this part at all, the bigger the jerk they are, the more they need you to speak love and hope and truth in their lives. Because the number one cause of jerkiness is a lack of love and hope and truth in a person's life. And if somebody's popping into your head right now, I'm really sorry, but there's your assignment. All right? That's your job right there. Now, what that means also is, and I'll give you a little commercial for something that's happening here, because what that means as a church is our purpose is to help draw people to Christ and to help them live out God's kingdom principles in their lives. And one of the things we got coming, we're, this is, we're, Barry's going to tell you about this a little bit, but I'm going to tell you now because I think it's so cool. We're starting something really today, we'll say first of September, but it's close enough, called Family Life Coaching. And I don't know if you know, Pastor Tim is on staff. We, we hired him. One big reason, he spent 27 years working at Cameron Boys Camp, and you don't know what that is. Cameron Boys Camp is the last stop on a bad train. If your kid just makes bad decision after bad decision after bad decision after bad decision, and everything else in the world you have tried has failed, you send that child to Cameron Boys Camp, where Tim was waiting there to try to figure out how to fix it. And over those 27 years, he came up, he realized what the principles were, the key principles in the family dynamic that make successful families. And we hired him looking for the opportunity when we'll be able to roll this out and say, here we go. So we're starting um, 
Spout Springs Family Life Coaching. It's not a counseling thing, it's a coaching thing. You'll go in, you'll talk to Tim, you'll do a survey, you'll figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are in your parenting, you'll come up with a strategy to, to attack and challenge it and make a successful family, and he'll help you get it settled and get it going. It's going to be amazing. It's too, ex- it's too intense for us not to charge for it. There's a charge. Don't worry about that part right now, though. But that is... We're rolling that out, and it'll give you an opportunity to get together with your spouse and with Pastor Tim, who knows all the stuff that can go wrong and all the stuff that works and come up with a strategy. And the reason we do stuff like that is because kids are eternal. I don't mean they're going to stay in your house forever, although that can be true. I mean they are image of God. They are made in the image of God, they have potential, they have an ability, and the number one way that impacts that is how the parents raise them, whether they're going to raise them to be successful or not. And so we're rolling this out, we're excited about it, They'll, you'll get more information as we, as we go into the service and stuff, so just to let you know, that, that's how you do it, you start saying that. Which means, by the way, which the second piece in the, in the puzzle, along with um, thinking eternally, is working pers- purposefully. Verse 11 says, we work hard to persuade others. Verse 18, it said, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ, and God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. What's that mean? It's my job to be strategically trying to reach people for Jesus and help them live into the kingdom that he has for them. Does that make sense? And when I say it's my job, I mean it's your job too. That's why you're still here. You ever think about that? If God's job was to get you to heaven, if that was his sole purpose, here's a better method to do that. I'm going to help you. This, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm telling God what to do, but here, here God's a better method. Is you have a group of super salesmen who can convince people, people like David, who can draw people to them, do the convincing, and the moment they get convinced, unless they're ready to be on the super salesman team, doop, you take them to heaven. Have, have you ever had somebody who, who would be a Christian if it wasn't for other Christians? Huh? When he leaves us behind, we tend to screw it up a lot. It would be more efficient to, the, to take all of us who wouldn't be super salesmen and just get it out of here as soon as we're ready. But he doesn't. He leaves us here. Why? Because that's not the only point. The point is we're all in the business of purposefully reaching other people, letting them know what Jesus has, letting them know how Jesus can impact their lives. And doing it in a way to advance his kingdom, to advance his principles, to fight human trafficking, to fight poverty, to fight all the things that make God cry, and to live lives that draw other people. That's why, ready? That's why you're here. Universally, every person in every seat in this room, you are here to help reach people, introduce them to a relationship with Christ, and help them live to advance the kingdom as you're doing it too. Why are you here? That's it. Now, the the exact details of how you pull that off vary from person to person. Like, for me, I'm not like a super evangelist. Some people, they can, you know people, they they go to, you know, on on an airplane, and they lead lead three people to Christ on a plane from here to, to Charlotte. You know, I'm lucky if I can talk to him about the weather from here in Charlotte, you know, or, or Europe, you know, just, uh, but I got what I can do, and I say, here's what I can do, and I'm going to utilize it, and I'm going to leverage it to reach people for Christ, and we're going to take it as a church, and we're going to do whatever we can do to reach people for Christ and to advance his kingdom. By the way, we talked, mentioned last week, if you were here, about we're talking about adding a third service or, earlier in the morning a little bit, and having that be a little bit different worship style, and you ask, why are you doing that? We want to reach people for Jesus and advance his kingdom. And if during our research on this, we find out that it won't do that, we're not going to do it. If we don't think it can actually help more people come to Christ and help more people advance the kingdom, then we're not doing anything here. Okay, we need to make that clear once more. We don't want to do anything that doesn't help reach people for Christ and advance his kingdom. We put toilet paper in the stalls because it will help us do a better job reaching people for Christ and advancing his kingdom. Because if you're in here all stuck up, you're not going to be able to focus. And you won't hear the message. 
First service didn't get that one. You're welcome. There is nothing we want to do as a church that doesn't help us reach people for Jesus, help them grow closer to Christ, and help them advance God's kingdom. Anything else, ain't got time for it. There's too many people who need God for us to waste time on anything that doesn't help in that area. Okay? Why do we have soccer camp here and stuff? It'll get them here. We can introduce them to Jesus. They can advance God's kingdom. Ding, ding, ding. When we're very purposeful about that. I am, I mean, anything that I'm involved in, I'm just, I'm just weird that way. It said Christ's love compels me. And I'm like, okay, what am I doing? Is it helping or hurting? If it's hurting, not going to do it. If it's not helping, I'm probably not going to do it. Because that's, that's what it's about. It's about purposefully living with the eternity of the other people in mind which has to have one more piece of it that we saw in that too. We saw it in David's life. We saw it here in 2 Corinthians. It says God knows we are sincere, and we have to live sincerely. See, that's what messed up David here, wasn't it? That's why the seed he, he planted in a quiche life's life couldn't ever bear fruit, because he wasn't living sincerely. Now, years ago, and by years I mean like 50 years ago, it was viewed that the pastor's role was to be the moral goal of the church. The pastor had to be the one who didn't mess up. He had to be the one who lived perfectly. Everybody had to look up to the pastor. We had to be like the pastor. Thank goodness I wasn't a pastor then. Because what happened is we, we come to realize that everybody screwed up. You know, we had a few colossal major failures in front of everybody. And it's like, oh, okay. So is Steve screwed up? <laughs> yeah, boy, is Steve screwed up. And the idea was there's all the people in the church and here's the moral best one at the top. And now it's like, okay, here's all of us and Steve's somewhere in here. Because we're all screwed up. By the way, that's how you have to live it. Wherever you go, you're looking at people from an eternal perspective. You're purposely living how you think would make them attracted to Christ. Not being somebody else. Being yourself, being the real you, sincerely. When I go someplace and I'm wanting to meet people, I got, I got an ace in the hole that I play all the time. My dad taught me this and his dad taught him this. And from the way it looks, it goes back generations. But Davis's from my family know how to be funny. And everybody likes to laugh. And I like to make people laugh. So when I go somewhere, I make people laugh. And people are attracted to that. And then I can start the process of showing them the love and acceptance of Christ in a way that's very non-threatening to them and very sincere. Now, if you're going to be sincere, let me tell you one thing you've got to remember. If you're going to do this, you've got to do this right. And the way that you do this right is sincerely means no strings attached. Friendship. Let's say you're I'll use one of mine at my gym, and I'm making friends with people. So I love to work out. I love being with people even more. It works out great for me, and I get to live, and I, I, I live, try to live as sincerely as possible in front of those people, and some of them end up in church, and some of them don't, and you know what happens to the ones that don't? They're still my friends just like before. If I'm looking at somebody purposefully and eternally and they never, ever, ever, ever darken the doors of this gymnasium, that's that's not good. But I'm okay with it. Because I'm not liking you because I have an agenda for you. I'm liking you because A, I like people. And B, because I recognize in you somebody who was created to be connected with God. You were created for a connection with God and to live into his purposes. And you'll never get the joy you should have in life if you're not connected with God. So when I look at a person, I say, the best thing for you would be a connection with God. I never say that out loud. That makes them feel weird. But that's what I think all the time. The best thing that could happen to you, not me, the best thing that could happen to you is for you to get a connection with God, grow into the person he wants you to be, and do the things he wants you to do. And I'm going to do my best to live with you and in front of you in such a way that you'll be drawn to that. I'm not going to browbeat you about it. 
Matter of fact, there's a, there's a woman who's a, we baptized her just a little while ago, and the first time I had a real conversation with her at the gym, her, 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 her number one statement to me was, don't you ever invite me to church. I said, yes, ma'am, never did. Comes regularly now. I never invited her. I just answered questions, lived with, lived in front of, lived sincerely, lived purposefully, lived eternally in front of her and with her. Do you know why there are fewer and fewer people coming to churches? Our church doesn't have this problem, but fewer and fewer people coming? It's because there's so few Christians thinking eternally, thinking purposefully, and living sincerely in front of others. They're selling something. They're fake. I'm not saying all or most. I'm just saying there's so many out there that act like they're selling something. And if you don't respond immediately to what I want you to say, then I'm turning you off and going to somebody else, and everything's a target, and everybody's not human anymore. But my job is to be Steve with people in such a way that they're drawn to the Jesus they see in me. Now, that's different for you than it looks for me. I mean, you probably didn't sit at your dining room table as a kid having pun contests with your father. That's what we did, (laughs) okay? But who you are as an image of God sincerely is attractive to some people. And they need you to be that person. They need you to be sincere. We saw David. Kish is coming toward God. David wasn't sincere, so Kish had to turn away. Now, last piece of that puzzle makes it all kind of work. Verse 17 of 2 Corinthians said, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Verse 14 and 15 says, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. And that is, you need to be transformed. You need to let God do the work of changing you into the person he wants you to be. We said it last week, an awful lot of Christians have this idea that all God needs to do with them is tweak them a little bit. Man, we all got work. <laughs> we all got stuff that God needs to really work, and we've got to be willing to let that happen. We've got to let God change us. Because, and here's the evidence, by the way, of that. One evidence of whether you're being transformed. See, a lot of you have these weird ideas that if, if I'm transformed in this, this, here, here, here's, a, here's a really good one. How badly do I want other people to come to a relationship with God? And how badly do I want God's kingdom to be advanced? I hate to break it to you, but if you don't care at all, you stepped out of the being transformed stage of life. God's not transforming, God's not working. I'm not saying it judgmentally, I'm saying it as an evidence of what's in your life, as a, like what the disease always has indicators of it. That's what happened with David, right? David stepped out of sincerity, he stepped out of being transformed, he stepped out of thinking eternally, he stepped out of all these things, and he comes and he's standing, standing with a quiche, and a quiche says, by Jehovah, by your God. And David only concerned about his selfish stuff. He didn't go, hey, you know, I recognize there's a battle about to happen here. But that's an interesting word choice there, Akish. Could we talk about that for a second? Could we discuss why you're using my God's name instead of yours? Could we stop and just have this conversation? Now, David was so caught up in his own stuff, his own selfishness, he'd stop being transformed. He'd stop thinking eternally. He'd stop thinking purposefully. He'd stop being sincere. He totally didn't hear it. He didn't hear the need. 
he didn't hear the cry for help. And he walked away, and so did Akish. And if there's no transformation going on in your life, and all of us can fall into these phases once in a while, but if there's no transformation in your life, you won't be able to reach others. You won't be able to advance the kingdom. And you won't even want to. That's a real good sign that you're just scattering the seeds of selfishness around you. God wants more than that from you. God wants more than that from me. God wants me to be a person who is passionate about what he wants to do in the lives of those people around me. Bill Hybels, I think it is, said, as you go about your day-to-day, you won't lock eyes with a single person that God doesn't love and want to have a relationship with. So, what kind of seed you been scattering? Now, here's the negative to what could be happening in your brain right now. The negative is, right now, you're analyzing your former farming technique. And you're looking at the seeds you've scattered, and you're feeling kind of guilty about it. Maybe not, just kind of. And you're kicking yourself. Well, number one, that's the problem with grass seed. Once it's scattered, it's scattered. It's out there. You can't pick it back up. So if you're kicking yourself because of that, the cool thing is, number one, God works through our failures. And number two, God just loves to forgive us. That's like one of his favorite things in the world is to forgive us. So if you're sitting there and you're kicking yourself because of how you've lived in the past and how your seed has messed up other people's lives or a decision that you made just caused a crash, a multi-car pile up, God wants to forgive you for that. It's what he lives for. Actually, specifically, it's what Jesus died for. So ask for forgiveness. That's what he does. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all the unrighteousness. Okay? So don't be kicking yourself about the seed that you've already scattered. The point of today is to focus on the seed you're going to scatter over the next phases of your life. You can't pick the old stuff up off the ground, but you can make sure that the next fling you make is good seed of love and hope and selflessness and faith and trust and hope. You can be the person in your office who, who is out there scattering seeds of love in a place where there is no love and scattering seeds of hope and joy in a place where there's no joy. That's what, God, that's what God wants you to leave with today. He doesn't want you to leave carrying some burden of your past stuff. He wants you to be carrying a sack of brand new seed of hope and love and joy. And he wants you to just go out and scatter it everywhere. That's what he wants you to do. Now, you might be here today and you don't have that relationship with God yet to where you can actually scatter those kind of seeds. And if you're ready for that relationship with Christ... If you're ready to accept him, what we do is very simple here. Most of you know this. If you've been here more than once, we've got these blue bags. We keep them right there, and we keep them there, and we keep them there, and we keep them there, and they're there every week. And what we ask you to do is if you're ready to check into a relationship with Christ, if you're really curious about it, you want to know, or you're ready to have the relationship with Christ, you just grab one of these blue bags from any of those locations. We've got people that are trained and one of them will come to you and say, hey, can I unpack that bag with you? And they'll take about 10 minutes. And they'll show you how to initiate a relationship with God and how to help that relationship grow into all that God wants it to be. 
And if that's you today, that's where you start. Because you've got to have the seeds of God's love in your life before you can scatter them to anybody else. It may be that you've accepted Christ, but you don't, you've never announced it. You never publicly acknowledged it. And that's why we do baptism. Baptism is when we do it on first Wednesdays, sometimes on Sunday, but usually first Wednesdays, where we immerse you in water as a symbol of the fact that you're now a new person in Jesus Christ. Don't have to worry about it. We've been doing it for years. We haven't lost a soul. It's rather easy. But it's a way of announcing, and it's the next step to say, hey, I'm going to be living eternally and purposefully in all the things I need to be doing. It may be that you're carrying a really heavy guilt about some seeds you scattered and just me saying ask for forgiveness isn't enough. And during the next song, you want to go over to the cross and pray and ask very sincerely that God forgive you for the seeds you've scattered. It could be that that person you thought of and you know now you're supposed to be treating them like they're the image of God and you're supposed to be investing and pouring and you're not sure you want to do it. You might want to talk to God about it over there. Let him kind of reconfirm and maybe give you some strategies. Maybe you want to take communion. We have a communion station here and one back there. And it's just a chance to remind yourself of God's love that he poured out on us so that we can pour out into the lives of others. I, whatever God's speaking, that's what you should do. But what I want you to remember is this. You choose the kind of seed that you scatter. And the kind of seed that you scatter will determine the seed the people around you gather. What kind of a harvest are you wanting to get? And what are you willing to do to make it happen?